you know, the best businesses in the world are transaction ready in that they don't require an advisor to come in specifically at a point in time and tell them where they're at because they already know. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast. Today we have the second part of our special two-part series about the amazing world of financial modelling. In this episode, we are talking with Michael Hutchins from the software company Madano. Michael is an ex-investment banker, professional financial modeler, software developing CEO. And in this and the previous episode, Michael discusses software and the nuances of financial modeling in sales and acquisitions transactions. In part one of our series, we looked at what financial modeling is, why it's important and where the real value lies. We discussed how financial modeling can provide the opportunity to take an understanding of your business to a whole new level and give you the ability to look into the future and test ideas you might have about how to grow the business. And we also discussed in detail the opportunities for accounting practices. So if you haven't yet heard that episode, I strongly recommend that you go back and check it out. But in this episode, the final part of our two-part series, we talk in detail about the ways in which financial modelling helps businesses plan for the future. We discuss the benefit of proper financial modelling in an M&A environment, and we look at how modelling can help identify when acquisitions might be a good strategy for growth. And on the flip side, as a seller, why and how businesses can get themselves in a transaction-ready state. So to kick it off, I asked Michael about how financial modelling can really assist in both small, simple acquisitions as well as in those larger acquisitions. If we bring all of that back to an M&A type situation where, and, and let's look at two scenarios, one smaller, simple acquisitions and larger acquisitions. So let's start with the smaller. Is this concept relevant still for smaller acquisitions? Well, it's hugely relevant. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting discussion. I mean, financial modeling and, and M&A, they, they sound so sexy. I mean, mm. you, you talk to people and when I came out of uni, I just wanted to do M&A. You know, I wanted to do deals, <laughs> right? And then, and then, I mean, the funniest thing I learned about M&A is the majority of what investment bankers do is run around like headless chooks doing whatever is necessary to close the deal. So <laughs> at least 60, 70% of your time is just doing admin and on planes and in meetings. Yeah. You know, so, so that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do financial modeling full time because I didn't have enough time to do that one thing well. But with investment banking and M&A and the types of deals you're talking about, it is funny because there's this big belief that M&A is really, really hard. When in actual fact, a merger is simply taking the components of two businesses and looking at how they would actually operate together. Mm-hmm. And obviously, there's, there's things like synergies, which is a really sexy word for, hey, if you had these companies in one building, you wouldn't need two lawyers. So mm. you can get rid of that lawyer. That's an 80 grand cost saving or 120 grand cost saving. So synergy is just a way for saying, you know, you get rid of double ups. And, and you look at the most complex. I mean, what's different about small business M&A uh, compared to large business M&A is that small businesses are obsessed with the cash impacts of the M&A transaction mm. uh, and the shareholder impacts. Mm. Whereas you look at large M&A, they're looking at earnings accretion dilution and, and impacts on stock market share prices and valuation. So with smaller businesses, it's often you're unable to go out and say, listen, there are 500 comparable companies, which you'd do, particularly in the US and the UK, you'd, in a large, large M&A transaction, you just look at comparable companies mm. and that would give you a lot of metrics and, and your financial model probably isn't as relevant as it is in Australia where there are less companies. But the interesting thing with M&A in Australia is you often have two owners and operators in smaller businesses negotiating over what they think is reasonable for their valuations. And once you agree that, the purpose of the financial analysis is really showing how that's going to impact them and, and what the cash and, and often the debt position is going to be as a result. So the financial model really is a sanity check on the viability of a deal. Uh, and in terms of M&A and mergers, con- consolidations and those types of things, it's not much different to building a standard model of a business, but you're taking parts of two businesses. And I've said to people for years, M&A sounds so sexy, but if you think about it, Imagine we had two businesses and imagine for simplicity, they were quite similar. So you decided you're running, say, a training business and you decide someone in, in Perth with a training business 
is running a very similar business and you think maybe if you merged, you could, you could more successfully move into the Queensland and, and South Australian markets. So you contact them and say, listen, there's a lot of opportunities for us to, to leverage off each other's client base and experience. Would you be interested in working together? And they say, yeah, I would. That's great. So you say, okay, let's, let's build what's called a pro forma model. And a pro forma model is a model that basically just shows how something that doesn't exist would look if it did exist. So you build a pro forma model. And the first thing you do there is you say, okay, in a model of just my business, I'm just going to forecast my revenue. In a model of our businesses, we're going to forecast our combined revenue. So for revenue purposes, you're really just, just bringing it all in. And you might break them out and show them as effectively two lines so you can show target acquirer. But effectively, all you're doing is, is adding both in. Now, where it gets more interesting is when you get down to tax and capital structure, where if you're a combined entity, you'd roll up all your debt, for example, into, into probably different facilities. You'd probably read what's, what's called refinance. You probably refinance and restructure your capital structure. Mm. But effectively, all you're doing is you're creating a, a really accurate view of what your business would look like if they weren't two separate businesses. And then, then the really exciting part of those models is saying, okay, if we merged, we wouldn't need to have two heads of business development. We wouldn't need two lawyers. And we'd probably be able to move into one office, which would be, which would be on, on a total cost basis would actually be a lot cheaper than having two separate offices. So what you find is that there's more value. You take the two businesses separately and they might each be worth $5 million. You, you put them together, they might be worth 15, 20. And that's the value of the model. You can see how the synergies give you that value uplift, but you also can look at how money is going to move as a result of the merger and, and the, or the acquisition. And, and that gives you clarity to, and shareholders clarity about, about what's actually going to happen when these businesses come together. So essentially, their modelling is giving us, I guess, three things in this area for an acquirer. So the modelling helps us identify when acquisitions might be a good strategy for growth, I, I guess, on the basis of what you're talking about here, as well as helping us to test when a target is found. So test, roll forward, work out our assumptions and work out what it will look like together as a merged em- entity. And I guess it also finally helps in post-transaction, merging and, and making it all work together. I guess that's what I'm hearing from what you're saying. Does that sound about right? Yeah. I mean, the, the post-transaction discussion is a whole new one because often post-merger is a fantastic time to consolidate the actual the analysis of the two businesses and actually start from scratch and build a, con- a consolidated model. But, but yeah, as, as you said, I mean, the real key to it is assessing the viability of something on one level and also then assessing how it would actually happen. And you'll see the reason why the investment banks of the world, they still use Excel. And the reason why no one in 50 years since the, the spreadsheet came out or 40 years since the spreadsheet came out has, has found an easy way of doing it is because it's, you need the skills, you need finance, tax, accounting and modeling skills to do this. And every business is, slight, is very different. That's the reason why the big four uh, and the investment banks actually they, they get paid a lot of money to build these models because without them, you know, you, you can't pay Oracle to build a database of a company that doesn't exist yet. Mm. The majority of accounting packages are based on your starting point is an existing business with existing data. And obviously, the, the big accounting package providers are trying to move into the forecast space, but it's just so dynamic. And it's so, as you said, you might actually just do a whole piece of analysis for a month in an investment banking role or an advisory role as an accounting firm just to test the viability of, of, of a potential strategy. And you're not going to want to implement an accounting package to do that because your accounting package is about compliance predominantly. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting stuff in that there's this big black hole when it comes to strategic analysis. And that's really what the modeling of M&A is specifically. Okay. Getting to that point where you decide something is or isn't viable is actually really the hardest part. Yeah. Once you've decided something's viable, you really just, it's like you've built the house, you're know, there and you're just painting walls and putting furniture in. But, but getting to that point is, is really where the the, the hard bit comes in. And that, that's really what investment banks do. I mean, investment banks charge success fees when they spend their whole life trying to find viable you know, combinations and permutations of companies working together. And if they find one they think works, they go out to, they go out to an organization and say, hey, have you considered buying this business over here? If they say yes, they say, we'll advise you $10 million fee to help you and it's a billion dollar transaction. That's how they make their money. Mm. So investment banks spend their whole life thinking strategically and don't really think much about compliance at all. Mm. You know, whereas, whereas, and the accounting firms at the very other end of the spectrum. And, the and I suppose the big message I've always had to people is that there's, there's a big void in the middle there. And I mean, we come up with this phrase we call transaction ready. And we say, you know, the best businesses in the world are transaction ready in that they don't require an advisor to come in specifically at a point in time and tell them where they're at because they already know. And that's where, you know, we, we, had a, we had a process a few years ago where a client came to us and said, oh, we're a bit of a mess. They're a novated leasing company, car leasing company, and they, they had quite a complex business. And they basically said, we don't really have a good budgeting and planning model. And we're looking at doing a whole lot of strategic stuff over the next few years. So we'd like you guys to help us build a day-to-day strategic planning model. So we built a, a monthly rolling planning model for them. 
And then they suddenly decided they wanted to refinance a whole lot of their, their debt. So we ended up working alongside a whole lot of banks, refinancing a lot of their debt. And then they decided they were going to IPO. So the most amazing thing happened. We, we actually got brought in alongside of UBS to work on a, on a billion dollar IPO wow. of a company, which we'd started with. I used to joke around to my friends saying we sort of, we started off as friends and ended up lovers. Whereas there was, there was, there was never, there was never like the, 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 the pursuit. There was never like, let's go out on a date. There was nothing awkward about it. We just, we just, we, we just started off as friends and it evolved into a, into a relationship where we ended up doing a billion dollar mandate IPO alongside UBS. And, and what was really interesting about it, UBS really didn't like at first, the fact that they couldn't run the model themselves because it's sort of the center of control when you're making decisions. Mm. So they turned around and said, we're going to build a parallel model. So they did late nights, this, this poor analyst at UBS just did all nighters for like two or three weeks. And in the end, threw his hands up in the air and said, listen, this is crazy. We've only got a couple of weeks to get this IPO going. So they ended up actually using the, the model that was owned by the firm that we'd built working alongside us. And I keep saying to small, I keep saying to small accounting firms, and, and that, that's a bigger end of town there. Mm. But if you start working with companies when they're small and they grow fast, you can build your business off the back of, of one of those clients. Mm. And I mean, a great example of that's a, a company called, um, you know, a company called, called Fonda Mexican, which people in Melbourne would be familiar with. It's a great Mexican chain. Those guys are growing quite rapidly. They, they were using a very small accounting firm very early on, but then they needed financial modeling services. The firm that they were using didn't have those. So they moved to a bigger firm that still struggled with those. Mm. Um, and we're helping them with that. But the irony of the whole situation was very early on, I spoke to their initial firm prior to this becoming an issue and said, you guys should upskill because some of your clients could grow and need this service. They were like, yeah, we'll wait until that happens. And they, and they missed the boat. Wow. Now they've ended up losing a client that would have, I think, been a nameplate client for them their best, because they, yeah. their best client. And yeah. now, now they're sort of still working with tax and compliance on much smaller businesses. And, mm. and, and I suppose what it comes down to is, as an accounting firm is what are your aspirations? And, and you've got to really think about that. I mean, even the bigger firms, I speak to them all the time and, and they, they tell me openly, we're really struggling to move away from tax compliance because it's just, it's just so easy compared to what you're saying. Uh, and, and then what a lot of them are looking for is a silver bullet, which is things like an add-on to zero where, where they get a cut and it's 50 or 100 bucks a month and it just plug in some numbers, gives you a great looking dashboard and you tell the client you're adding value. But you know, I'm pretty harsh on, on a lot of those programs because I don't think, I think they actually take control away from the company and from mm. the advisor, mm. and you're effectively outsourcing your analysis to a third party that doesn't understand your business and isn't even integrally involved. Mm. So whether you like it or not, to have a deeper relationship with your client, it takes time and investment of, of time and energy and passion to the point where you, you genuinely understand your client's businesses. And I mean, we've got clients that will call our consulting directors on a Sunday afternoon before they do a transaction saying, I need to sit down with you Monday morning because we're about to make a bid for a company and I'm not comfortable doing it without speaking with you guys first and making sure the numbers add up. Mm. So when you get to that point with a client, you're in a very, very good place. Yeah. Because they see you as a trusted companion, not only in relation to their compliance, but in relation to their forward, their forward success. Mm. So it's, it's kind of like I always joke around saying, I always associate my first, my beer with a Friday night because I always have a beer Friday when I get home. And, and I always said to friends, it's sort of like I associate a success, a satisfying week with a beer. Um, if you can get to a point where, where a client basically associates successfully running their business with you being in the room when they make decisions, yeah. you've got a life. Yeah. And that's where you think about accounting firms right now, they, they're killing each other on margins and fees. Technology mm. is eating clients work. I find it extraordinary how so many accounting firms are lapping up technologies, which in some regards are taking control away from them and killing their margins. And then they're doing it because they're a lot easier to use. Like, there's a lot easier to implement zero and maybe take a cut and plug and, and basically plug some numbers in than it is to actually learn a skill that, that is much more complicated. Yeah. But, but, but at the same time, there's a lot more upside in skills which can't be automated away completely. Mm. Oh, look, I think they're really great points you, you make there. And, and certainly your point about being transaction ready. I, I just think that, you know, this is the sort of things that I'm constantly preaching to from a legal perspective as well, because it, it's exactly the same from a legal perspective, you know, organisations being transaction ready, you know, because from a legal perspective, it can sometimes take a while for a company to be cleaned up. And there's often leakage that can happen, particularly through that due diligence phase, you know, when clients come in and they're not transaction ready, so they're looking to sell or not transaction ready. And it sounds like it's exactly the same from the financial modeling point of view, being mm -hmm. able to give them the insight to ensure that from a financial perspective, they're also transaction ready. 
Oh, no, it's, it's 100% the same thing. I mean, I, the two examples I always use, and I think, as you're saying, the legal side is exactly the same. It's, it's really come, the, the, the great example I always use is touch typing. Now, most people know that touch typing saves them a lot of time, and it takes probably 100 hours to get to a point where you can do it somewhat reasonably. Yet very few people in the world do it because they don't want to invest that initial time. Mm. And therefore, each year, they probably spend two or 300 extra hours typing. You know, it, it's one of those things where you sit there and you go to companies, you know, you should fix this now. And we always joke around with our consulting business saying people come to us when they're either petrified of running out of money or they're really excited about getting really rich. So normally when people come to us, things are either really good or really bad. But when, we, when it's business as usual, they're like, oh, I'm all right. And it's sort of, it's sort of the same with the gym. Like you look at people, yeah. you know, more people are obese now than ever before. In fact, I think more people are obese than not obese. And people know they're not doing it properly. They know they're not eating well and not doing enough exercise, but, but they're not fixing it in a hurry. Mm. Once you do fix that, you see people that have this dynamic where they're just fit, they're eating well, and they have that positivity that comes with getting it right. And I think getting people out of that, mentality of, oh, I'm okay, I'm doing okay, is a real challenge. But once you get them out of it, you become friends for life. And that's where I think with, with a lot of businesses, a lot of businesses are in that space where they're not making, and I've been this personally over the last five or 10 years, where my business at times has, has not been going badly, hasn't really been going well. And suddenly I'll find something outside of work and you know, excites me a little bit more than my mid-sized business. Mm-hmm. And suddenly you're struggling to get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And I, one of the keys with thinking strategically in your business is you, you're constantly aware of the opportunities. Whereas, whereas when you're just focusing on the now and today and yesterday, you're sort of, you're just focused on getting by. And that's where, you know, there's a, there's a whole psychological analysis you, you could do of, of the types of people that love financial modeling and strategy versus the ones that are more focused on, on compliance. Mm. I think with, with accountants generally, they, they're generally risk averse. I wouldn't say the average accountant is, is a really strong salesperson. I would say they're much more the guy you'd rely on to get something done than to go out and pitch a new concept to somebody. And obviously, you combine the risk aversion on that, they, they don't want to look stupid. Mm. So they don't want to go out and pitch a service they're not comfortable providing. They're, they're often concerned about investing a huge amount of money in upskilling their staff on something that might not work. So there's this chicken and egg problem where, where they're thinking, you know, what if I spend a whole lot of money getting my staff fired up about this, and then the clients don't even want it, and I've just lost, I've just spent thousands of dollars investing in something they don't want. And then what if, I, what if we do go out and the clients want it, we build it, and we don't do it properly, and it doesn't work, and we look stupid? Mm. You know, are we, going to lose, are we going to lose the compliance work from that client? So it's, it's a really, it's certainly a much, much riskier field. I'll openly say that than ticking boxes. But at the same time, it's, it's almost a necessary next step for accounting firms that want to be more to their clients than just, just effectively a, a compliance officer. Mm. And, you know, and there's a need. As I say, I, I certainly think that in the next five to 10 years, the world of accounting is going to change massively. You know, technology is, is having a very big impact. So I think these opportunities to build differentiation and to enable you to find a way to really give life to that value add and to stop leakage of your best clients, you know, should be a really strong impetus for mm. accounting practices to look really seriously at this type of opportunity. Well, it's, uh, it is. I mean, the thing is also there is just a lot of money there. And it sounds, it sounds crazy, but I mean, um, I think I was mentioning to you last week that the stats on this, we, we did some stats on just the Australian market size. And, and even with the out-of-date stats, we did this a couple of years ago in 2015. And we looked at it and there are, in Australia alone, there are, there are over 2.1 operating registered businesses with ASIC. Mm-hmm. And then you look at that and, and over, what is it? I'm just looking at the numbers now, over, over 250,000 of those have more than five staff. And over 50, 50,000 of them have more than 20 staff. So you've got a situation there where we always look at companies as, and we, we basically tell them, you should be spending as much on your planning and analysis as you are spending on your website. And what's amazing is because everyone's scared of not selling enough, people happily spend on website. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people spend on SEO services without any idea whether they're going to get a return on that. Mm. But very few companies will spend money on strategic planning tools because it's just like, well, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to get out of that and I don't really need it. And I'm not going to feel bad because most companies don't do it properly. Mm. So, but if you, if you do some basic numbers and say, well, let's assume that the average company in Australia with more than five staff has a budget of $5,000 a year for planning, which I would argue is negligent not to have. You've got five staff, you're paying bills. If your average salary, say, even if it's just 60 or 70 grand a year, you know, you've got sort of three to $500,000 worth of cost there. You probably should spend 1% of that planning. Mm. So if you do that and you say, okay, let's, let's assume that, then straight away in Australia, you've got between five and 20 staff companies. You've got, you've got a billion dollars worth of fees there that the companies have to spend. Then you take it up another level and you say, okay, the companies with 20 to, to 200 staff, there's 50,000 of those. Now, those companies are what we call the sweet spot financial modeling. They're companies that often have a budget of 50 to 100 grand for a model per year. 
and that's still less than one full-time staff member if they're experienced. Yeah. But you sit there and say, okay, well, that, that literally is another $1 billion worth of revenues. Now, for accounting firms to go and get. And what's amazing about that is that I would argue right now, and I'm very confident in saying that I think that right now, probably 5% of that market is being serviced. And it's being serviced by, you know, the mid tiers, the big four, it's probably a lot of those companies would, would that consider, the big four rarely touch a model that costs that they earn less than 40 or 50 grand of fees from. So you've really got a billion dollars worth of fees sitting there. And the most amazing thing about that fee pool is it's not the most sophisticated modeling. So the most sophisticated modeling is your 200 plus companies, which we've been working with a lot, which are companies like Origin, where you build a transfer pricing model that's 10 meg that takes three months to build and analyze really complex operational drivers. The average company with, with 15 to 20 staff, they just need an integrated three-way model that rolls. And, and the technology we've built and the technology that's out there today, a lot of different tools are getting close to supporting that. And our system does support it, but you just need to learn how to use it. Mm. So, I mean, what I say to companies, I say, listen, you've got the clients. You've got the clients, you've got the demand, even if you don't realize it yet, you just probably haven't told your clients that this is possible. And that's where the, the marketing in, is, is very much an educational process. But when you say to people, go out to your clients and, and show them this, have a coffee with them and say, hey, you're turning over $5 million now. You know, you may even IPO in five or 10 years hmm. or three or four years. Hmm. Um, have, you, have you thought about taking this to another level? This is most, most bigger companies do this and, and inspire them to do that and bring them on the journey with you. And that's really where I think there's a huge growth opportunity. But as we keep saying, at the very core level, you need to understand financial modeling. And then that, that's obviously my mission in life is to make mm. people financial modeling is not a scary word. It's actually really cool, exciting stuff. And, you know, and for younger staff, financial modeling skill, it sounds terrible, but most staff we train up, we struggle to keep them because we, we, we outsource them to companies and companies are like, oh, we're paying you two grand a day. You know, these are 25 year old, 25 year old guys and girls. And they're like, oh, do you want to come and join our company for 100 grand a year? We're <laughs> you like, need, oh, so it's, you need some clauses in those agreements with your clients. <laughs> well, we, we try. It's hard, but it really is hard. And, and the funniest thing is it works well for us because often they'll go across and then we'll end up with, with more work coming from an ex staff member working in that client. But, <laughs> but the one thing I have noticed is that people with financial modeling skills are, are literally bombarded with career opportunities. So it, it, one, of the, one of the ways I motivate people to get into financial modeling is saying, listen, if you, want to, if you want to advance your career faster than everybody else, you know, learn financial modeling. Mm. The vast majority of the youngest CFOs and CEOs are people that happen to be in a place where they learnt these skills very early in their career. Mm. You know, you think about it, as an investment banker, within six to 12 months, you know financial modelling. And that means you could go and run a mid-sized business at 26 because you understand businesses. Whereas, you know, if you've spent three or four years doing compliance work, you could go and do compliance, but you're not going to get paid a lot for that. And you're not going to be sitting at the table when they decide whether they're going to IPO or not. Mm. It's a very exciting field to be in. But, um, but it, people need to accept the fact that it's not something you can just plug and play. It's an art and a skill and it's hugely valuable, but it's, um, it's more sophisticated than other things. So you need to learn how to do it. Oh, you've got me. Look, the enthusiasm you have for this financial modeling. I tell you what, I just want to come and join the band. I want to do some financial modeling myself. I can, I can feel the energy. <laughs> Actually, the biggest challenge as a company is that we all, we're all obsessed. And, and the biggest challenge we have is, is we, we love modeling anything all the time. So one of the biggest challenges I face on a, on a weekly basis is I'll be out at a, at a function or a first birthday or a drinks night for somebody's birthday. <laughs> and one of my friends will say, oh, my business is now turning over $5 million. And I'll say, oh, so how, how are you doing your modeling? And have, you, have you run some numbers on that? And they'll go, oh, no, no, what are you talking about? And then, and then I'll get calls from mates, you know, at three o'clock on a Tuesday saying, <laughs> oh, can you come and call my company? And then, you know, it's funny because, you know, we're trying to stay focused on, on our day-to-day things. But the reality is I, I'm discovering pretty quickly the only people that don't want models are the people that don't understand how powerful they are. Yeah. And it, it's kind of once you give somebody a good model, they become obsessed. And we mm. joke around, we call it binary flip. People will just, they'll get a model and they'll, they'll think, oh my God, how did I go without this? But it's very much an educational process. And that, that's the, probably the hardest thing for accounting firms is you've got to educate your clients as to why they would want this before they'll realize how valuable it is. Yeah. And then, and they've got to get it themselves, the accountants, I guess, first, you know, to be able to communicate that value. So, Michael, where can our accountants or our listeners who are often end clients, buyers and sellers, um, and brokers as well, consultants, where can they go to get more information about how your software works and how financial modeling could work for them? Well, there's, um, and I don't want to put an outright plug in here, but... Um, go for it. Tell us where to go. My company is Madano. And what we've done is we've realized that the majority of the small end of town, what we call the small end of town, just don't have this skill at all. So, um, so we've created a, about a 20 hour training system you can go online and, and do, and it's, it's all completely free purely because what we find once people learn how to model, they're interested in using our software. So it's actually in our interest to educate people on this. 
So we've created effectively a, a 20 hours. It's basically seven exercises and each one you build a model, you submit it and you answer, you have multiple choice questions. So you actually, you actually, it's effectively moot building of models for clients. Mm. So we're providing that service. Um, I'd also recommend the key is you need to get your hands on examples of financial models. Even the best financial models in the world, and people that have often worked at the big investment banks, they've learned through osmosis. So you need to, you need to get your hands on example models. Now, we provide some um, on our website. You can go on LinkedIn and you can find people providing them. You can go on different websites, just search for financial modeling examples. Uh, you really want to focus on integrated three-way models. That's the key. They need to have a, an income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow. And you need to just, you basically need to pull them apart and put them back together again. But what you need to bear in mind is that the fundamentals of financial modeling are the same for all types of financial models. So the people in the sector will love to tell you how complex it is and how what they do is different to everybody else. But on a core level, we all face the same gravity. We're all in the same universe. So what you find with financial modeling is if you understand the fundamentals of, so for example, we break models up into eight areas, which is operational, which is revenue expenses. And then you've got your working capital, which is debtors and creditors. And then you've got your assets, which is the fixed assets and intangibles. And you've got capital structure, tax, financial statements, and you've got to outputs and other, which is where you do evaluations and so forth. Now, if you can understand how to break a company up into those pieces and analyze them, you'll be able to do everything from over time, you'll be able to do everything from M&A to consolidations to strategic planning to what if analysis. So my advice to, to accountants is, is don't go straight for the LBO because everyone on Wall Street is talking about it. LBO is just another really complicated, sexy sounding phrase for effectively building a three-way model that contains a bit of restructuring on day one because your management's buying the business out, you know, and you're restructuring the, the capital structure. But start off with the fundamentals. So learn how the three financial statements relate to each other on a forecast basis. Learn how, how financial modeling differs from accounting. Financial modeling isn't like debits and credits. When, when you model revenue, you forecast revenue on a, normally on a accruals basis, and then you make adjustments for cash. So, so debtors as models an adjustment. So a great example of how modeling differs from accounting is with accounting, you'd obviously, and this will test my accounting, I'm, I'm, I'm not a CPA, but <laughs> with accountants, you'll actually book revenue and you'll say, okay, you know, you know debit, debit accounts receivable, credit revenue. And then when the revenue, when revenue comes in in cash, you obviously decrease your accounts receivable and increase your cash. cash. Um, but in modeling, it's quite different. You look at it and say, what is my revenue going to be for the next period, which might be a month or a quarter or a year? And you'll say, okay, my revenue is going to be a million dollars. And then you'll make an assumption and say, what is my debtor's day? So what is the number of days on average that it takes me to collect my debtors? And you'll say, say 30 days, which in a, in a 365 day year is about a 12th. So a 12th of that million dollars will be an adjustment to cash on the cash flow. So you might have revenues of a million dollars, but your, your cash will be less than that. It might be just over $900,000. But the way you model that is as an adjustment to cash. And the reason why as adjustment to cash, but the revenue is forecast independently of debtors until you do the cash adjustment. And the reason why you do that is because the revenue is different from almost every business in the world, whereas debtors calculations are often done just using debtors days. So these are the fundamentals that people need to learn. There, it is quite scientific, the fundamentals. It's, it's when you start looking at specific industries and specific structures of businesses where it gets complicated. And again, we, we can help with that as a consulting firm with accounting firms. But the first thing I would do is learn the fundamentals, which as I said, you can try going to Madano.com so, um, and, and do the, the online learning there and just search the web, have a go. And then, and then you really need to get your hands dirty. So choose a client, not too complicated. I would recommend starting with a business that contains a single currency, single entity business. You know, you don't want to start off doing a multi-currency consolidation. That's, that's going to make you, you, you burn out and you're probably going to think I'm never going to be good at this. Start with a simple business, simple drivers, single entity, build it up. It'll probably give you, they're the types of businesses that we build. We build models of businesses like that for one or two grand for clients and they love them. Um, and that's your starting point. And then you build up on that. So each, each, each time you start feeling comfortable, take on something a bit more complicated. You know, throw in multi-business unit analysis, throw in a discounted cash flow valuation. Um, and then over time, you, you'll be a financial modeler and, and it will be easy. It's sort of like playing the guitar. You'll start enjoying the sound of the, 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 the music you're playing. Um, and that's when you become valuable to your firm. And that's when you become hugely appealing to, to employers and, and the whole world starts changing. This is brilliant. Okay, so let's recap then. I think that the top four action items that we've talked about here is get trained up on the fundamentals. So get across how accounting is different to modeling. I, I think you've talked a bit about that. Number two, look at examples of financial models. So you talked about where our listeners to can go and find some examples of financial models, both on your website at madano.com and the other tips that you gave. Number three, sorry. 
And number two, there are there are actually a lot of sites you'll find them on. So just right. search Google financial model examples. Don't trust them all. A lot of them are horrible, but um, but they'll <laughs> they'll they will teach you something. And so the get your hands dirty, but choose something that's easy to start off with. So single currency, single entity company. Yep. And I guess fourth, the last element there, which you alluded to at times, which I think is probably quite important, is to then start communicating the value of modeling to your best clients. Yes. Get in a way that you understand deeply the value, the true value for them and start communicating it. Absolutely. And that, and that is, as I said, an educational exercise. And I mean, what we find people relate to most on that front is case studies. Mm. Um, we, we love case studies like Grilled and JB Hi-Fi because they're household names. Mm. But the most important thing, if you can find a relevant case study and that gets easier over time, it gets a lot easier. So if you can say we worked with a franchise business just like yours and they're now, they're, they're, they're now able to do X, Y and Z, you'll hit a nerve and the founder will say, oh, it drives me crazy how I can't do that. And that's when they'll come and say, we want that too, because envy is, is a huge driver. <laughs> mm, yeah, absolutely. Oh, look, this has just been um, really great. I think it's been really interesting information for our listeners in relation to financial modeling. Certainly very exciting. I've never felt so excited about the topic of financial modeling before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad I excite you. I mean, obviously we love it. It's, a, it's almost a disease. I, I think my wife wishes I didn't, I didn't like it so much, but um, <laughs> we, we just we just love it. It's right, right in sort of the, the core of the action. So uh, now we love modeling and, and we love seeing people convert to modelers because they convert and they never go back. So um, the more modelers, the merrier as far as we're concerned. That's amazing. Look, I can really see the opportunity here. You know, the opportunity for accounting practices to get something that's a differentiator and something that really adds value to their best clients and help build their profile, but also, you know, the fee base from their best clients and, and importantly, to stop leakage of your best clients. I think that was a really good example you gave of the problems of putting it off until tomorrow because you, mm. you might lose your best clients in the meantime who really need this insight in their business. No, I think I think that's a really good way of looking at it because I think most accounting firms assume their existing client base is a given and they look at ways of growing it. I think in this day and age, you need to be thinking both ways about that equation. That is, if you're not providing these services and somebody mm. else is, mm. you know, can you can you afford not to? And if, if that's what it takes to motivate you, that's still a good thing. Mm. Whatever whatever makes you move forward. Mm. Brilliant, wonderful, and and I think the really big takeaway that I heard and that you know I really subscribe to as well is is ensuring that our clients are transaction ready. I, I think that that's key and that's fundamental. Yep. Brilliant. Look, thank you so much, Michael, for coming along. Once again, if people want information, they can go to your website at madano.com. Yeah, Madano. No, no, I really appreciate you having me. We, uh, we don't get much opportunities to talk about this to, um, to the broader market. So it's, uh, you know, we're, we've always been part of the inner sanctum of financial modeling, working with bigger firms. And it's, it's exciting for us, you know, going out into, and dealing with, with people that are, that are just becoming a part of this world. So, mm. you know, our, our ambition is to take financial modeling to the masses the way mobile phones have got to the masses over the last 20 years because at the moment, you know, big firms have big clunky financial models just like big ugly phones back in the 80s. So we are, mm. we want all businesses to have access to high quality analysis and that's, um, you know, things like this are really helpful. So thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Brilliant. Thanks so much for coming along, Michael. Thanks a lot for tuning in to the Deal Room podcast. Just a quick recap. In this episode, we talked about the wonderful world of financial modeling and all about how it can create planning for the future of a business. Whereas accounting is often backwards looking, we see financial modeling as forwards looking and allowing organizations and accountants and brokers and consultants acting for their clients to be forward looking on behalf of their clients. For accountants and brokers, Brokers and consultants, this is certainly an opportunity to provide a real value add, to provide a differentiator for your practices, and also to stop leakage of your best clients for many accountants. And as I said in the interview, I really think one of the key messages is keeping organizations transaction ready. Certainly from a legal perspective, that is a really important area to be on top of and things to note with your clients, the importance of being transaction ready from a legal perspective. And I think Michael really spoke well today about the importance from a financial modeling perspective of ensuring that your clients are transaction ready. If you'd like more information about this topic, head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. That's thedealroompodcast.com. 
Through that website, you'll be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you'd like to read it in more details. And there you'll also find details of how to contact Michael at Modano or to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you'd like help with any of the items we covered today. We can't talk about financial modelling. You'll have to talk about Michael and Modano about that. But we can certainly assist when it comes to dealing with businesses, getting transaction ready, ready for a safe ready for a purchase or a merger. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. Thanks again for listening in. I'm Joanna Oki, and this has been the Deal Room Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.